Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Kathy Fitzmorris from the Central Office, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Are you running your business, or is your business running you? Your microphones and telephones are currently muted to eliminate background noise during the program. We will take questions at the end of the presentation. To ask a question, type it into the question box on your control panel, or if you have a working microphone, raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon on the control panel, and I'll unmute you. Today's program is being recorded and will be available through WebMQS in the Shared Resources section, and I'd like to thank our Albany SBDC for arranging this webinar. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm very pleased to introduce Lisa Manning. Uh, a little background on Lisa. She began her career working for a very large firm where she learned a lot of fundamentals about business, financial statements, and what works and what doesn't. At heart, she's an entrepreneur and has always been an entrepreneur, so she left the big firm to start her own company where she specialized in interim COO and CFO work and putting out fires in companies. Lisa's husband is also an entrepreneur and his company had hit a ceiling and was experiencing flat growth and stagnant profitability. He asked Lisa to take over as COO of that business, and during that time, they hired an EOS implementer. EOS stands for Entrepreneurial Operating System. What followed in her now family business was a period of 30 to 50 percent annual growth, and the company became so profitable they were able to install a bonus plan for all employees. Lisa continues to sit on the board of her husband's company, but spends most of her time working with leadership teams to help them become black belts at managing their business. Lisa's passion is helping entrepreneurs achieve freedom in their lives, and relieving them from the stress that comes from running an entrepreneurial business. Lisa has helped over 100 companies along their journey to achieve goals. After 25 years, she has found a proven system that is simple, practical, and has worked in over 3,000 companies. And today, she's going to share that system with us. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much, and thank you for reading that, <laughs> just as I wrote it, kind of a joke. Um, so, I have two goals for this session today, and those goals are, number one, to get you to look at your business at a different way and get you to see it through a different lens, create a context to simplify the way you look at your business and gain control, and secondly, to give you tools, to give you simple, practical tools to help you get more done and run a better business. Now, as Kathy said, my passion, my obsession, is helping people run a better business. So before we get started, I'd like everyone to just take a minute or two and think about what your one goal is. You know, maybe it's five years out, maybe it's ten years out, and there's only two, two rules in thinking about that goal. And one is it has to be at least five years out. And number two, it can only be one thing. So just jot it down, the one goal. What is it that you want from your business? Okay, and we're going to come back to that in a few minutes. So just take a minute to do that. Um, in all the years I've been working with leadership teams and entrepreneurs, I found that there are two types of people. There are the entrepreneurs who are getting everything they want out of their business. And um, they're peaceful, they're happy, and then there are those entrepreneurs who are not. And those are the entrepreneurs that are particularly frustrated. The frustrations they see are things that look like this. They're lacking control, control over their business. They're lacking profit. I mean, entrepreneurs get into the frame of mind that if the number at the bottom of the PL is a negative, that's awesome. So, you know, where's that standard where they want to actually make money? Um, there, another key frustration is people. They just have total frustration with what's going on with their people, um, their employees, vendors, their partners, their customers. They've hit the ceiling, meaning things just are stuck. Things are not working. And um, lastly, nothing's working. So they try something every single month. It's the flavor of the month. And still nothing is working. 
So one of the things we're going to talk about today is a way to kind of break through these frustrations. It, what we're going to talk about is it very simple. As we mentioned earlier, it's been implemented that we know that at least 3,000 companies, not including companies that have self-implemented. Absolutely everything I'm going to show you today is available for free on the website. Okay, and I'll share you the website, share the website at the end of this presentation. It's eosworldwide.com. Everything is available for free. Um, so with that said, what we're going to start with is a model that focuses on your business. Along the years of working with entrepreneurial companies, the founders and the developers of the entrepreneurial operating system had a discovery, and the discovery was this. To the extent that you can strengthen six key components in your business, the rest of the problems will just kind of melt away. Said a different way, entrepreneurs typically struggle with about 136 different problems on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is something that's really kind of um, very satisfying to me, that to the extent you get strong in just six key areas, all those little problems kind of symptoms. So this model that I'm going to share with you today is a journey that companies go through to get strong in those six key components. So what are those six key components? The first one is vision. And by vision, we mean how do you get the entire organization aligned around where you're going and how you're going to get there. The second key component, excuse me, is people. Um, you have to have great people. So getting really strong and having the right people in the right seats for your organization because you know, every single organization is different. They're, they're great people for you. Same as great people. Yeah. Meaning, how do you get a pulse on your business so that the data doesn't lie and you're not left with opinions? The fourth one is issues. Um, successful people and successful businesses are really strong at solving problems. And to the extent that you can develop the muscle memory and the strength to be a, a fantastic problem solver, your business is just going to be better. The fifth key component is process. And by process, and have a your business for more fun to run that way. And last but not least is traction. That's where we bring vision down to the ground where you get the discipline and accountability to achieve your vision. You know, most visions go unrealized because they don't have the discipline and accountability. So as the saying goes, vision without traction is hallucination. Um, so traction is a very key component in this model. So those are the six key components that we um, teach entrepreneurs to get strong at as a leadership team. And as goes the leadership team, there goes the rest of the companies. Lisa, I'm sorry. The ability in your functioning code. So to get yes, I'm sorry to interrupt. The audio is coming out now. Yes. Suddenly, a little funny. Um, do you? I'm not sure if you have other applications you could close or. I apologize. Um, everyone. Hold on. Is it breaking up, Kathy? Yeah, it breaks up, and um, also a cell phone nearby can cause it, um, or you might just have to, I apologize, dial in to, I'm Hold sorry, on it, it was fine when we were practicing, so. We left off with um, starting to, I was just going to go through this two 
specific disciplines that we teach to get strong in the six key components. So to take you back again, what we're, what we're suggesting is that to get really good at running an entrepreneurial business, you need to be strong in six key areas. There are two disciplines I'm going to teach you to help the entrepreneurial business get strong in those six key areas, okay? So the first one is vision. And in terms of the two disciplines, the first one is answering the eight questions. So how do you get your leadership team completely aligned around the eight questions? Try to make it less, you know, less is more. Could not boil it down to anything less than eight questions. So the goal is to be able to pull each member of the leadership team and in fact the company out to the, and get them to be able to answer these eight questions in the same way. So what are those eight questions? The first one is core values. Now core values is a term that's been completely overused and become trite over the last 20 or 30 years. What we're going to suggest is there's still tremendous value to the word, to the term core values. However, it's not maybe the way you're thinking of it. This is not externally focused. It is not for marketing reasons. By core values, we mean what are the words that you use to describe the culture, the people? What are the words that brought the leadership team together? And we take you through a discovery process to say, if you could have, if you have three of these awesome people, if you could have a hundred of them, what would those words be? What does that look like? What are the words that represent your culture? So for example, to the extent the company is just a company of people that work till one in the morning and they're firing off emails, one of their core values might be hard working. I mean, that's just who they are. And to the extent you don't identify that word, if you hire people and they don't possess that, they're just going to be expunged because it doesn't fit right. Um, let's say you're a very collaborative organization versus, you know, a competitive organization. You know, you have to identify what are those terms, what are those three to seven terms, probably around five core values, okay? We'll talk about that more in a few minutes. The second question is core focus, okay? What is, the, what is your purpose, core cause, or passion? And there's two hemispheres here. You need to know you know, emotionally, why? What do you get out of bed in the morning? Why? What gets you out of bed? And what's your niche? What do you have that no other company has? What's your superior skill to do? And then um, you as a leadership team must agree on what that core focus is. And that will help discern the things you shouldn't be focused on as the shiny bits come flying in, as they always do. So to the extent you can um, crystallize what the core focus is, you have to stay laser focused on that, okay? The third is what we talked about at the beginning of this call. What is that big goal? Doesn't have to be 10 years. Um, we use the term 10 years because on average that's what the companies that we work tend to pick the most. Could be 5, 10, 20, 30, but what is that one thing that you want to get out of your business? Next is your marketing strategy, very simply put. So by marketing strategy, there are four components, four aspects that we talk about. The first one is what's your target market or the list? What is the demographic, the geographic, and the psychographic of your list? The next three are messaging related, okay? Um, the second one is your three uniques. Now you might possess two of the uniques that your competitors possess, but typically the third one your competitor is probably not going to possess. So what are the three uniques that you as an entrepreneurial business possess? And that should be in all of your messaging. The next component is your proven process. You know, when we say what are the three pieces of your marketing strategy that belong in your messaging, is there a proven process that you have? Can you get it down to one page? color copy one page, here's our proven process, and the last piece of that is what is your promise or guarantee, okay? The fifth question is your three-year picture. So if you know where you want to be in 10 years, where do you need to be in three years? You know, a couple of key stats, and what are the five to 15 bullet points that describe that, okay? The sixth one is your one-year plan. 
if you need to be at X revenue in three years, and that's where you want to be, where do you need to be in one year? And what are the most important things you need to do this year to achieve that goal? Seventh is a term we call rocks, quarterly rocks. Um, or leadership teams generally have an, an attention span for about 89, 90 days. So we set quarterly rocks. What are the three to seven most important things, priorities, that need to be solved in the next quarter so that you're on target to meet your one-year plan? And last but not least is what are the company's issues? Just get it down on paper. There's something um, psychologically that helps by just getting all the issues down on paper. And later on we'll talk about how you solve those. So the first discipline within the vision key component is the eight questions. And the second one is shared by all. To the extent that you can get 100% of the employees to be able to answer those eight questions in the same way, the laws of just line up and you will just get there faster. Okay? That doesn't mean you issue an email and say, here's the answer to the eight questions. You know, you have to repeat it seven times for folks to hear it, get them engaged. And we encourage our entrepreneurial companies to have a company meeting and repeat the vision every single quarter. The second key component is people. And there's two disciplines that we talk about with respect to getting um, great people in your organization. Again, every organization is a snowflake. So great people in one organization is not the same as great people in another organization. And why is that? Well, the first one is you have to have the right people. And how do you figure out whether you have the right people? We use a tool called the People Analyzer. Now, a few minutes ago, I talked about core, um, core values. What are the core values? Here's an example of core values for you know, our organization. Um, humbly confident, grow or die, help first, do the right thing, and do what you say. So what you can do is come up with the core values of your organization and then analyze your people, analyze your leadership team to see if those are the right core values, first of all. And we do a simple thing as, as just using a plus, a plus, minus, or minus. A plus means 80% of the time they demonstrate these core values. Nobody possesses everything 100% of the time. Minus means the majority of the time, or 80% of the time, they don't demonstrate these particular words. Okay? And plus minus means sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Okay? And so once you discern what those core values are and you you know that they're the right ones because the leadership team possesses them. You can then set a bar for the organization. We're not saying that everybody has to possess all of them, but maybe you want to set a minimum bar that they have to possess at least three out of five of those core values, okay? Because that's one half of the equation. Are they the right people, meaning they possess the core values? Now, the other half of that um, combination is right seats, meaning do they have the God-given talent to do that job, okay? And the way we figure that out is by using something called the accountability chart. All organizations have pretty much these same functions, okay? They have a sales and marketing organization, operations where they deliver product or services, and basically a finance organization. In some bigger companies, these are split up. Maybe you split sales and marketing. Maybe operations is more than one function. Maybe finance is split between HR and IT. Now, these major functions are run by a, a position we call the integrator. Okay, And that's the person that cohesively manages those um, other departments. So, we like to encourage structure first, people second. So um, with the one other question you have to answer, and you guys might see this a lot in your entrepreneurial organizations, is 50% of the time there's also a visionary. Now the visionary and the integrator are two very, very different kinds of people. Okay? The visionary is the person with the big ideas. They might set the culture. They um, are great at at um, big relationships, etc. The integrator is 
the tactical person. They run the day-to-day. -day. They are the ones that run these other functions. And they're also responsible. Let's say the visionary has 20 ideas in a month. You can't do them all. The integrator's job is to filter those ideas and figure out tactically you know, which ones can we actually execute on. Okay? So once you decide what the accountability chart looks like, you then figure out what are the five key roles for each one of those boxes. Okay, what are the five key roles? After you do that, you answer the question for each of the boxes, does the person get it? Do they want that job and that role? And do they have the capacity to do it? So remember I said in discerning whether you have the right people in the right seats, there's two halves of that equation, right people, meaning they possess your core values, and right seats, meaning they get it, want it, and have the capacity for what you have the key roles of that function to be, okay? So you need both pieces to get the right people in the right seats. That is um, essentially the, three, the last three boxes of what you can add to your people analyzer to say, do, are, do we have the right people in the right seats? Do they get it? Do they want it and have the capacity, okay? So moving on, we're going to step into the data component. And data is great because data doesn't lie. And to the extent you can become better predictors of your business, you will be more successful. So one of the things we teach is the notion of a scorecard. And by a scorecard, we mean something that looks like this. Um, every measurable has to have one owner, OK, and one person only. You need one set of eyeballs to look at and say you're responsible for that. The metrics that we put in, we generally encourage 5 to 15 metrics. Now, these metrics need to be key performance indicators, which means you don't want to fill this up with P&L driven metrics, because that's in the rear view mirror. You need to look at things that are going to dictate whether your business is OK going forward. So one of the exercises we say is, if you're on a deserted island, and somebody's going to hand you a piece of paper to know whether your business is OK or not. What are, the, what are the numbers, what are the metrics you want to see on that piece of paper? That's all you can get. So it's going to be things like um, perhaps number of leads, number of meetings you've had, a customer SAT score, things like that. What are the key performance indicators? And then you should have a target for each one of those. And on a weekly basis, we've only shown three weeks here, but we encourage all our entrepreneurs to get in the habit of having a 13-week view. So keep a running 13 weeks of all of these metrics with a target, and then you can see whether you're on or off track. And you will get better at predicting your business, OK? So go through a process to figure out what the 5 to 15 are and start tracking them on a running 13 weeks. Here are a few examples of things you might put on there. Weekly revenue, cash balance, sales calls, sales meetings, number of proposals, closed business, customer SAT, accounts receivable. That might dictate whether you're having a problem with customer SAT, uh, accounts payable, or number of errors. These are just some examples of things you could put on that scorecard. Uh, utilization capacity is another one. So the other discipline that we teach within data is to come up with measurables. Every person in the organization should have at least one metric as a component to assess their performance. So figuring out what that one number could be. Now, leaders might have certainly more than that because the leaders are going to possess the other numbers on the scorecard, but every employee should have at least just one. OK, so once you have the people component strong, the vision component strong, the data component strong in your organization, you're going to find that the organization is much more um, translucent. And issues are going to bubble up. So what needs to happen is you need to get really strong at solving issues. And there's two disciplines there. One is the notion of the list. So everybody in the organization feels comfortable, open and honest, to be able to populate issues. So you have an issue list at all times. Here's the issue. 
And then how do you get really strong at solving those issues? We call it IDSing. And by IDSing, we mean I for identify. Get to the root cause of the issue. What's really the root cause of the issue? So you have to dig down and figure that out. If something is, let's say, shipping, packaging is not working, well, what's the root cause? Is it a people issue? Is it a process issue? A training issue? Um, in the five years that we observed leadership teams having leadership team meetings when they were trying to solve problems, what we learned is that the majority of the time spent in meetings was spent discussing, discussing, discussing the issues and never solving, okay? So the second component of IDSing is discuss, but everybody discusses once and only once because after that you're politicking, okay? So you get to the root cause, you discuss it, and then you move directly on to solve. So to the extent you can get really strong and powerful, it's solving issues once and once and for all, you're just going to be a, a stronger organization. The fifth key component is process. So by process we mean imagine if the organization was like a franchise, kind of like McDonald's. Everything was documented and everybody did things the same way because you probably know from seeing organizations that the breakdown happens between the departments. So let's say somebody does a verbal contract. You don't have a signed deal. Well, you know how that ripples through to operations. You don't really have a signed deal. And then finance goes to invoice, but you can't invoice because you don't have a PO, et cetera. So having, and by documented, we're not talking about ISO 9000 or anything like that. Less is more. You know, one to two pages, bullet points, here's the process, and then um, get it followed by all. And by core processes, there's generally six to ten in every organization. There's people, how do you hire people, fire people, assess people, market, how do you get leads, uh, how, you know, um, how do you, what's your demand gen look like, sales, how do you close those leads, get business, operations, how do you deliver your product or service, there might be a couple there, and accounting. Um, meaning how do you take in money, pay out money, etc. And last but not least, customer retention. You know, how do you retain your customers? So figure out what the six to ten core processes are and document them. Bullet points, one to two pages. That's it. Less is more. Then get them followed by all. 100%. This is the way we do things and get it followed by all. And by really focusing on the most important you're not going to get bogged down in the detail of all these other things, okay? Last but not least is the traction component. By traction, what we mean by that is how do you get discipline and accountability? So um, that's really important. As I said earlier in this call, you know, a lot of businesses and visions go unrealized because they can't achieve the discipline and accountability um, to actually execute on their vision. So there are two tools we use there. And the first one is setting rocks, and those are the priorities. So what are the most important things? And, you know, it's very, I'll typically come in and look at an organization every 90 days and we've, we've set the rocks and said these are the most important things the organization needs to do in the next 90 days because we have a one-year plan. We've set, we've set a big giant goal 10 years out. We've set a three-year goal and we've set a one-year goal. So keeping that in mind, what are the most important things we have to do every quarter? And we encourage setting three to seven as a company. And then the leaders have three to seven, hopefully closer to three. And then you measure it every 90 days. You know, what, what's the achievement? Did we stay focused on those rocks? Because every small business has so many things, people wearing multiple hats. The ability to stay focused on that is critical. The other, the other discipline is meeting. What is the meeting pulse that, um, that's happening in the organization? What does that look like? So one of the things that we teach, hold on one second. 
is a notion of a meeting cadence, okay? And the meeting cadence that we typically teach is, you know, there's a two-day annual where you're talking about the plan, how did you do, what do we need to change about the vision, where are we going next year. There's a quarterly meeting cadence, and that's generally, you know, a, an all-day meeting off-site with the leadership team where you revisit the vision, you look at um, how did you how did you do last quarter? Did we achieve our rocks? And then, is there anything we need to tweak on our vision and set our rocks for the next quarter? Okay, and say what are the most important things we need to do next quarter? And then, how do you get into a weekly cadence? So, what we teach is a weekly cadence that looks something like this. We call it the level ten meeting. We call it the level ten meeting because. We, we encourage rating every meeting on a scale of 1 to 10. Why? Because it becomes a self-correcting meeting. So at the end of every meeting, you're going to rate the meeting. Every member that is in the meeting rates the meeting. Okay, And the score is not a score for the person that facilitated the meeting. The score is the score for the meeting as a whole. So how did we do as a leadership team? So for example, any score under eight or seven, you're going to say, all right, what is it that we can do next week to have a 10 for this meeting, a 10 out of 10? And at that point, everybody shares how we can do better next week, next week so that we're always having a self-correcting meeting and we're getting better. We use the same agenda in every leadership team meeting, and it looks like this. The first five minutes is really it's designed to be get you out of your business and thinking um, step outside of the day to day and get you thinking on the business. And psychologically, the best way to do that is to start with a positive focus. So it is one business best, one personal best. So it's very brief, you know, about six words, such as we closed a huge deal with. X company and uh, my child had their eighth birthday, something like that. And every person in the meeting, you go around quickly and you do good news, business best, personal best, five minutes. The next one is a review of the scorecard. Earlier on, we talked about the five to 15 metrics that are on the scorecard. You have a target every single week. And all you do is you look at that scorecard and you notice whether they're on or off track meaning think of it as they're red or green versus the target. You don't talk about it there. This meeting is meant to be exception-driven, not talking about status, exception-driven. If it is off track, you're going to drop it down to the issue list, and that will come up later when we IDS. The next five minutes is a rock review. So you review the company rocks and the leadership team rocks. And the only thing you share in that time is on or off track. Now think of it as you're in a 90-day cadence. You're going to have, on average, 12 meetings in that 90 days. So in, in those 12 meetings, those 12 weekly meetings, you are going to ask every owner of those rocks, are you on or off track? Now to the extent somebody says they're on track for 11 weeks, and then on the 12th week they kind of say they're off track, you as a leadership team are kind of going to go, hey, wait a minute. Um, but really, it's on or off track. If it's on track, you don't talk about it. If it's off track, you don't talk about it here. You drop it down to the issue list. And I'll talk about that in a second. Then we have another five minutes where you talk about customer and employee headlines. These can be good or bad. If something comes up that's bad and there's an issue there, you're going to drop it down to the issue list, which I'll show you in a minute. So five minutes to do headlines. Sometimes people have them. Sometimes they don't. It might be this customer is really upset about something. Let's put it on the issue list. Then we do a five-minute review of the to-do list. The to-do list is the to-do list that came out of last week's meeting where we did our um, solving. and it's the component of any to-do that can be done in seven days. So for example, if last week when we were solving problems, we said so-and-so needs to document a process for or communicate a change to, you put the portion of that that can be done in seven days on the to-do list. 
in this level 10 meeting, you simply say done or not done. Every week, 90% of these to-dos should be rolling off. If they're not, you as a team need to discuss, you need to IDS why you're not getting your to-dos to done. Because you want to encourage an environment where you create a to-do and it gets done. So this is where you, you're simply going to say done or not done. So as you can see here, the majority of this meeting, we encourage a 90-minute meeting for the leadership team should take place on the same time, at the same time every single week. And you attend that meeting unless you know somebody's died or you're on vacation. And it, the, to the extent that you can make this just set in stone, um, the level 10 meeting, it's a leadership team meeting that's going to happen, for example, every Monday at 9 o'clock. It's going to be 90 minutes long. You're going to have the reporting at the beginning, and then the majority of the meeting is going to be issue solving, okay, which we call IDS. Now, again, where we talked about the reporting component, if we were to go in order of the agenda, and something was off track in the scorecard, and you stop to talk about it there, you might not be picking the most important issue for the week, which is why we literally just bring up the fact that something's off track, such as the scorecard is off track, a rock is off track, um, or that there's a, a problem with the customer. It goes on the issue list. So you come into the meeting, it's a dynamic agenda, and on the agenda is, are all the issues. And then you prioritize what are the one, two, and three most important things that as a leadership team you need to be discussing at that time, okay? And then what do you do? You IDS it. You identify the root cause of the issue. You discuss it. Everybody has an opinion. And then you solve. To the extent there's a tie, the integrator's the tiebreaker, okay? And then you move on to the next issue, and then the next issue. So you're spending the majority of your meeting talking about the most important things to the company, the things that are causing the company to not be on track for the quarter, which means you won't be on track for the year, okay? So at five minutes before the end of the meeting, no matter where you are, because one other thing that's really important is starting the meeting on time and ending on time, which means you dial in five minutes early, because early is on time, on time is late, okay? So five minutes before the end of the meeting, you wrap up and you conclude. And you conclude by doing a couple things. Are there any cascading messages that you need to communicate outside of the leadership team? You review the to-dos that came out of this week's meeting. You just recap them. And lastly, like I said earlier, you rate the meeting. You go around, and everybody that's in attendance for the meeting rates the meeting on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best. And if the score is 7 or less, you can decide to do less than 8. You then ask, what do we do better next week to make this meeting a 10? Okay, so that's what we call the level 10 meeting. Getting into the cadence of having an exception-oriented meeting happens the same time every week, starts and ends on time, and follows this cadence is extraordinarily powerful to get the discipline and accountability in an entrepreneurial company. So I know I've gone um, very fast through these things, but I'm just going to review again. Um, what the key components are to be really strong at running a business. Now, again, if you do not have um, a product or service that somebody's interested in buying in your market, this isn't going to help that. But these are designed to help you run a better business and get what you want out of your business. So that means um, being really strong at vision, having everybody aligned with where you're going and how you're going to get there, having being very strong at the people component, which means how do you have the right people to possess your core values in the right seats, okay? So design the, the seats and the boxes first, identify what the roles are for those boxes, and then figure out are those people the right people for those roles, okay? Do they get it, want it, and have the capacity? The third is data, meaning 
having a weekly scorecard that helps you predict what's going to happen with your business and immeasurable for every employee. Issues, having a list. Everything is on a list that you're going to prioritize what needs to be solved based on the most important issues. And then how do you identify, discuss, and solve, get really strong at solving issues once and for all. The fifth is process, meaning six to ten core processes, documented one to two pages, and followed by all. And last but not least, traction, which is setting your rocks, your most important priorities to focus on every single quarter, and what's your meeting pulse, which we encourage a level 10 meeting for the leadership team every single week, same day, same time, always attended by everybody. And then once the leadership team gets very strong at the level 10, you can roll the level 10s out to the rest of the organization. You can have departmental level 10s. You can certainly do that. If any of these tools, what we say is there are five tools, that five of the ones that we talked about here, that are going to get you 80% of the way there. They are what's called the VTO, Vision Traction Organizer. The eight questions that I talked about in the vision are in a document on our website. Pull up the document, use the document. If you don't do anything else, go answer the eight questions and get everybody following those. It's the eight questions are on what we call the vision traction organizer, which is also the VTO. The second one is the accountability chart. Take the time to figure out what are the major functions in the organization. No people on it yet. Have the people, the leadership team, pretend they're on the board. Have them write out the, lead, the boxes on the key functions, sales and marketing, operations, finance. What are the five key roles for those boxes? Do you have an integrator and a visionary or just an integrator? Write out what are the five key roles of the integrator? What are the five key roles of the visionary? And then start putting the people in those boxes and use the people analyzer to figure out are those the people that get it, want it, and have the capacity for those roles, okay? And if they don't, it's an issue you need to solve. You know, can they delegate it? Do you need to hire somebody? You don't have to just go out and fire everybody the next day, but it's important to go through the exercise to see where the weaknesses are. The third tool you can go look up is just rocks. Set 90-day rocks, okay? If you take the time to do, answer the eight questions, vision, traction, organizer, you're going to know where you want to be in 10 years, in three years, in one year. If this is where you want to be in one year, what are the most important things you need to do in the next 90 days? Three to seven, um, hopefully closer to three. Less is more. The fourth is the level 10 meeting. Institute a level 10 meeting. The agenda is on our website. I know I went through it quickly. Pull up the agenda um, and follow a level 10 meeting. And fifth is a scorecard. Start somewhere. It takes one to three months to get the scorecard in a place where the leadership team really, really loves it and feels like the weekly scorecard gives them a pulse on the business. Start somewhere. Do the discovery. Figure out what are the five to 15 metrics. Assign, every metric has to be owned by one person on the leadership team, needs to have a target, and a, a keep um, a running 13 weeks so you get better at predicting your business. So if you do nothing else, you do these five tools, that's going to get you 80% of the way there, okay? So if you can start with that minimum, that would be great. Um, if anybody has any questions on that, um, first of all, my name is Lisa Manning. Here is my email address. Here's my phone number. Feel free to call me. Every single one of these tools are on our website, okay? Um, one of our core values is help first. So everything is available for free. You can pull any of these up. You can go to www.eosworldwide.com and pull up any one of those tools. Um, again, EOS stands for Entrepreneurial Operating System. Um, and we have, there are about 140 implementers currently in the world. We're typically former business owners, et cetera, that now do this or implement this for a living. But 
there are thousands of companies that self-implement EOS by just going online, downloading the tools, and self-implementing. I'm certainly available to answer any questions that you have, or you can reach out and call me for free, not a problem. Um, so I think, Kathy, I think that's, that's all I have for now. I want to open it up for questions so we have enough time. I know I went super fast, and I'm hoping some folks have some questions. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Lisa or any comments, any experience with this? I'm not seeing any come in. Lisa, from your experience, have you had a lot of resistance when you've tried to um, have companies implement the system? So I will tell you that, um, you know, the companies that are most likely to implement the system are the companies that are ready to be open, honest, and vulnerable, okay? So a lot of times they're people that attend peer groups that are doing continuous learning, stuff like that. Those are the ones that are always trying to improve and get better. So they're the ones that are most likely to implement EOS. I can tell you we have tons of testimonials. On average, companies that start implementing EOS grow um, on average 20% per year. And, you know, I had, you know, I've been in the business world for, you know, 20 plus years. And the first time, and, you know, running businesses as a CLO or CFO, working with entrepreneurs. And when I saw this for the first time, I thought, oh my gosh, this is the simplest thing I've ever seen. You know, because I would go in and into a company that might be in crisis or might not be profitable. And you, one of the things you have to do is you have to look at their dashboards and their metrics and their accountability chart and their processes, things like that. This, to me, was the fastest, simplest way to get there. Because it's really, they're simple, practical tools that anybody can do. Even if you self-implement, you are going to be better. And, you know, people say to me all the time, um, do you think there's a benefit to self-implementing versus using an implementer? And the analogy I give them is absolutely. It's the same as going to a gym. If you start going to a gym, are you going to get benefit? Absolutely. If you work with a trainer, you're just going to get more faster. That's the only difference. But a lot of companies can't afford to hire an implementer. So we say, go on the website. Answer these eight questions. Get aligned. Because it's not that companies don't have a vision. It's that they're, they're in disagreement about what the vision is. Okay? Um, so the resistance, you know, sometimes companies will say, well, this doesn't really apply to my company. Our company doesn't really fit this model. We have had companies in absolutely every single industry implement this. I will say that Companies that might be run with by um, private equity, things like that. Sometimes you have a veteran CEO who's already run eight companies, and they don't need to do this. But your average entrepreneurial business that's privately owned, um, they are awesome at their vision. They're awesome at ideas. That doesn't mean they're necessarily great at managing and running a business. And as the business grows, it gets more complex. So how do you teach somebody like a visionary who's always done everything themselves to let go of the vine? How do you teach them to delegate? How do you teach them to put other leaders in place so that the company can scale, so the company can grow? And what are the things you need to do to do that? Well, the structure of this system is what enables them to do it. Because they all have fear, you know, an entrepreneur, you know, when I go and meet with entrepreneur after entrepreneur after entrepreneur, they all have that level of fear. They have fear, you know, because they've seen other companies go under. They might have gone under once before themselves. You know, half of all businesses that start won't be around in five years. And it's hard. It's really, really hard. So to the extent that we can say, here's a menu, go follow it. It's kind of a no-brainer. Just go do it. They're excellent at their business. So this is a formula. It's a, it's, it's a proven process. Just go follow it. You know, I mean, this is the simplest part, in my opinion. They're doing the hard stuff. This stuff should be simple. 
So I, that's a, kind of a long-winded answer to your question, Kathy, but um, that's what I typically experience. Is there a particular size company that this works best with, say, greater than oh. 25 employees? Or? Oh, that's a great question. So we say that the sweet spot is 10 to 250 employees. That's the sweet spot. Now, we have tons of companies that are two employees running on this. We also have some companies, we have one company that's over 5,000 employees running on this. They're a $2.5 billion organization. This wasn't designed for that, but you're certainly going to get benefit if you're using it. So 10 to 250 is the sweet spot. But again, as long as you have a product or service, you know, because it's not going to help you if you're not there yet. If you're still trying to figure out um, what your business is, it's not, it's too soon. But once you have a product or service and a market, right, and you're starting to generate revenue, yes, you're going to get benefit from implementing this. And the sooner the better. You know, take, take the guesswork out of how am I going to manage this business and grow. Just follow the formula is what I say, you know. Um, and another, that, yeah, yeah, I think sure, that's go ahead. a great answer. Um, how does one open up to questions when too often in organizations the higher ranked employees tend to dominate conversations? How does one, say that one more time, I'm sorry. How does one open up to questions when too often in organizations the higher ranked employees tend to dominate conversations? Oh, yes, and, and that is, I mean, I see it everywhere in all of, all of my clients, and that's, that's pretty typical. So there's a couple of things that we do to manage that. That's the, you know, the one instance where a facilitator does help because, it, you know, a facilitator is the one saying, you know, they're kind of monitoring for that, and they can see that the other people are rolling their eyes or they're frustrated from their body language. So what, a couple of things you can do is, number one, when you have your level 10 meeting, if you're rating the meeting, you can give that feedback that there wasn't enough dialogue, there wasn't enough sharing by other people in your 1 to 10. And in doing that, you make it an issue as opposed to something personal, okay? So you, instead of attacking the person, you say it's just an issue. We needed to get more feedback, more opinions from other people in the organization, and therefore I rated the meeting a 7 instead of a 10 or what have you. So that's one way you can do it. The facilitator, the person that's running the meeting, which we usually encourage that to be not really the CEO or the integrator, we say it should be the best facilitator. Okay, so the facilitator, their job is also to cut people off, you know, and to say, you know, and, and once the organization starts practicing that, it becomes self-correcting, you know, practicing that behavior. I know it's ex extraordinarily difficult when that person happens to be the founder and the visionary. So use the level 10. Use the scoring of the meeting to communicate that, you know, that you want to get more input from other people in the meeting if the facilitator isn't as comfortable with that. And the other thing I sometimes do is if um, the facilitator is having a hard time cutting somebody off, um, in those meetings, pass the baton around. Let other people take a turn facilitating so other people can see what it's like to try and cut somebody off. You know, that's another thing I encourage them to try because they can see how hard it is, you know? That's a great, great suggestion. Yeah. Um, and we it's have... It's not going to happen overnight. You can have to... You are going to practice having meetings that get better and better over time. You know, like the first four to eight level 10 meetings you have, you know, you're kind of you're kind of going to stink at it. I hate to say it. You know, I've had clients that have level 10 meetings and they start out doing it and they say to me, we never got to IDSing. We never got to issue solving. We spent 90 minutes doing, you know, walking through the other things, which is not the meat of the, the so it's, it's not where you're supposed to be spending your time. You're supposed to be spending your time on exceptions not chatting about status because it's not productive. So if you're supposed to be talking about where things are off track, not chatting, okay? So that's why designing the scorecard is so critical. How are you going to know whether you're on or off track? 
but it takes a while to get really good at a level 10. That makes sense. Um, of all the obstacles, what do you believe is the toughest for a company to overcome? I think the visionary integrator is really tough. I think it's really tough. Uh, it's a journey for the integrator and the integrator, the, the visionary and the integrator, um, to, to, to find their way to working together. Because the visionary is used to owning everything. They're used to feeling responsible for everything. And um, getting to the point where they can trust enough to, to delegate and to lean on the integrator. But if the organization has a true integrator, this book called Rocket Fuel, you should get if you're questioning whether this person is a visionary versus an integrator. Get the book Rocket Fuel. Um, also, you can get the book Traction. talks all about ELS. But anyway, so if you truly do have a visionary and an integrator, a visionary like half the time is somebody that has ADD, they have tons of ideas, they're just going to get bored with the day-to-day. -day. It doesn't mean they can't run the day-to-day, -day, but they're going to get bored with it. That person being able to let go and rely on the integrator to run the day-to-day, -day, that's really hard. It's really hard. So it's a journey. Don't expect it to happen overnight. You know, and I think that's the most difficult. Um, that's the most difficult. But, you know, being focused on, like, one thing I see is sometimes I can think of, you know, um, some, some companies I go into where the leadership team is completely picking on the visionary. Like, you never delegate, you never delegate, or whatever. And um, staying focused on the accountability chart and saying, these are your roles, these are my roles. Okay, so this is my camp, this is your camp. This is what I do, this is what you do. And if they're, if they're jumping into each other's camps, it's not personal, it's just an issue. It goes on the issue list and you IDS it as a team. Great. Does anybody have any other questions for Lisa? Doesn't look like any more are coming in, um, so we can go ahead and wrap up. Uh, thank you 